Hey there, welcome back to the final part of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. I hope you found inspiration in our guest journey this week. Today, we'll leave you with some key takeaways and actionable insights that you can lean on. Now let's wrap up with some powerful lessons that can help guide you on your own path. Don't forget to tune in for a brand new guest next week on Monday. But for now, enjoy this week's. Please subscribe to the channel if you don't already as well. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. After your after that nine o'clock and you saw that twenty one year old, how does your shift even carry on? Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, that's that was through years of experience of <laughs> we saw so many things and you were expected to just get on with it. And that's them treating you like a robot, treating you like just a number. And it was difficult. And that's why people become hardened and they become too hardened. Yes, you need to become hardened because you need to be able to go again. But being too hardened where then you're not going back and analysing that day. You're not going back and analysing that. Well, wait, how did this make me feel? I remember how it made me feel. I need to speak about it. And this is what they don't do. They just become hardened and they just go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And then we're on to the next day. And they go from the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. And that is a surefire way to burn out, to um, physical symptoms coming up and, and mental symptoms coming up too. Yeah. Trauma will never leave your body if you don't sort it out. It's going to get stored somewhere. And many people think that they can just keep going and be like, oh, it's fine. It will catch up on you, whether you, you see it or not. And there's a reason why, from my experience, I've heard many police officers and many people in the front line not live too much longer after retirement. And for me, personally, I believe that trauma has a lot to do with that. Yeah. Did you ever go and... That day, did you go and speak to somebody? Did you go and see your boss? Did you go and, I don't know, speak to a counsellor or anything? I remember speaking to my inspector, not on that day, but a couple of days after. And I spoke to him and I said, I'm really struggling after Roy's passing. And he was typing on his computer and he looked up at me and he said, you'll need to get that sorted. And then went back to his computer. And I just thought... Oh, I just thought, fuck, fuck this. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought, like, no, this is just, I will, no matter what, I will never be treated inhumanely. And that is, that's, that's being treated as like a number. Like, you know, if someone who's witnessed trauma, especially one of our own, to get that response, I thought, nah, this is, you're making my mind up for me. See if the police covered me in cotton wool and said you know what all of the support is here for you but they don't yes they will send emails out to say you can get counseling but they send it out a couple of days after because something about trauma takes time to whatever i'm not sure the exact thing of it yeah. but they send that email out and then you'll you'll read it and you'll go to your colleague and you say but did you get that email and your colleague will be like, oh yeah, I deleted it, a lot of shite, wasn't it? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'll delete it too. <laughs> because it was part of the culture. And yeah. even the email, the way it's said and formatted, it's more like, you know what, you've witnessed this. It's you know a generic email that's sent to everybody who's witnessed this thing. If you're needing counselling, you can contact us here. If you're needing this. And I was just like, really? Where's the human side? Where's the personal approach? And I yeah. firmly believe that... <laughs> Counseling should be mandatory in the police. It should be mandatory. Whether you want to speak or not, you need to be put in front of a psychologist or a counsellor, no matter what. And you can then dictate if you want to speak or not. But giving them that opportunity has to be there. It has to be there. Whether it's once a week or what. But not giving the, giving the police officer an opportunity to say no and delete an email. Of course they're going to do that. Yeah. They're busy people too. They're, it's like male mental health. Males are so... Uh, it's it's such a culture for males not to open up and say, I need help. But maybe somebody offers them, them help in person. They're like, by the way, I'm here for you if you need to talk. Then they might think, okay, yes, you know what, I'm here. 
But an email doesn't cut it. We need to get people in front of people and then start saying, look, you've experienced this. Whether you want to talk or not, I'm here. Do you want to talk about anything? Whether that conversation with a, over a cup of tea lasts five minutes or an hour, yeah. you're putting them in front of these people and that's what needs to happen. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'd think it would be quite logical common sense, wouldn't you, part of the recovery process? Exactly, you would think. But instead, we've got damaged people making decisions and dealing with other damaged people. That's 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 society. That's the policing 101. Yeah. Obviously, some people will be better at managing their stuff and not be as damaged. But I firmly believe that should be the, <laughs> that should be the police uh, motto. Damaged people protecting damaged people. <laughs> <laughs> I won't make that the title of this part of the episode. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we need to cut that one out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was your last shift. Um, what did you do then in the next few months? The next few months, I, I just went through this deep discovery, asking myself all these questions. Because I looked in the mirror and the person looking back at me in that mirror, I didn't recognize. I didn't know who it was. Yeah. And Bet, I just yeah. knew, I knew I didn't like it. I knew I didn't, didn't like the person. And then I also knew that it, it comes down to me. I can read all these books. I can listen to these podcasts. But it all comes down to me. I have to do the work. So they can give me the, the, the skills. They can give me the tools. They can give me the knowledge. But I had to do the work. So I did the work. And I did the work not in a way that was like right I've got a piece of paper and I'm going to do the work it was quite organic where looking back I realized that now that I did the work you know so I say I did this I follow this seven steps to a happier life and this is what my TEDx talks about and it's about asking myself what are my core values who am I surrounding myself with what makes me unhappy um needing to be positive am I being positive enough in my life and things like this Asking myself all these questions and following this procedure, I was like, right, I'm actually now feeling better. And it wasn't enough for me just to be out of the trauma. You know, just because trauma wasn't getting added to my day, yes, brilliant, but it wasn't enough to me for me to heal just because I was removed from it. I needed to do the work. And by asking myself all these questions, understanding who I wanted to be and what purpose I wanted to have in this life, I then started to understand what I needed to do. But as I said, I didn't necessarily say core values, write them down. It was just all thinking like, well, what do I want to do in my life? And then I look back in my life and think, I, I set out my core values without understanding that I sort I sorted out my core values. I cut people from my life without necessarily saying, who do I need to cut? It was organic. It was just things like that that happened. But now I put them into this, these seven steps to a happier life thing that people can follow. And it's simple things, as it's simple things of writing down your core values is simple for people to follow. And it's so ne ne um, necessary to do. So yeah, it was, it was a dark, if I'm honest with you, it was a dark few months, yeah. but you know, I, I, it was something I needed to do. And with Louis by my side, I was able just to heal with Again. him. And, and yeah, and that's the thing, he's, he was with me the whole time. And because I was unable to walk, it was very difficult. So I wasn't getting the physical exercise to help my mental health. So it was a difficult time, but it was the time of reflection. And I think that that word sums up those months. Yeah. Reflection. Yeah. And you didn't really have much choice, did you? Because you were injured out. Like you were playing a sport, you were out for months. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing you took leave from the police and, and still got paid for those months, right? Yes. So I was fortunate enough that... I had got a doctor's line that was able to sign me off saying you know, he's tore his ACL. He cannot even oh. walk near my doing anything else. Blessing in disguise. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was so, it was such a blessing. And I was able just to, you know, not many people have the opportunity potentially mm -hmm. to sit down and still be getting paid for sick leave, but to understand what I needed to do. And look, I, I didn't necessarily say to myself, I will, Definitely after my last shift, I will definitely never return to work. You know, yeah. I, it was a process. When my inspector said that, I did think, hold on, there's things need we need to change. Yeah. But it was this process. And after a few months, I realized then, you know what? 
after when my sick line's up this month, I've got a couple of weeks left on it. I'm will. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna come back. I I, yeah. I can't do it. So yeah, it was it was a journey. It was a journey within those months, but a journey I'm, I'm very grateful for in uh, in a messed up way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a good way to say, it, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. What um? So what what line of work did you go into next? Because you went on a bit of a journey just before before you started uh, your yeah. motivational speaking. So I got I I needed the job because I knew that I did like I didn't know at that point I I was going to be a motivational speaker, but. I knew I wrote down in a piece of paper that TEDx talk and that's when I wrote that down. So I knew in my head kind of what I wanted to do, but I, I couldn't speak about these things. So I got a job in the Scottish government as an investigator. So I was investigating social workers and care home staff with some of the, the misdeeds and misbehaviors that they would do. Oh. So it was, it, was a, it was a job that, you know, yes, there was trauma in it, but I wasn't seeing anything. So the, the things I was reading didn't, impact me because I was used to seeing these things. So reading about them, although it was like, oh, that's horrible. It wasn't trauma led for me because yeah. I was used to it. So it was, it was, yeah. it was a fine job to have that just tied me over, which especially during COVID with lockdown stuff, I was able to work from home, started to enjoy more of this freedom aspect. And you know, you could pick your hours a little bit more, hmm. not fully, but a little bit more and there was flexibility. So you know it was a good job for that time of my life and it was yeah it it it, it tied me over until i was in a place where i'm like i need to take this step now and we always when we're going self-employed there will always be that step that you think if i don't quit will i ever if i don't take that jump will the universe believe that i believe in myself and believe in this so i eventually took that jump and here i am today i'm still Still falling on that jump, <laughs> mate. You're not falling, that's for sure. You, yeah. You're still, no. you're still climbing up. I'm still, you're still on that leap. I reckon. Yes, yeah, that's d it. D yeah. So, how? I mean, your last day as an investigator, next day motivational speaker. Is it that crystal clear? How? How do you do that? Like, if I was to quit my teaching, and I'm not going to teach after tomorrow. I mean, I, I, I have taught. I have finished yeah. teaching. I have quit. Essentially, I'm a casual okay. teacher, so I have no stresses of a teacher apart from the fact that I have to do a recess or a lunchtime duty. Oh my God, <laughs> worst stress ever. If that's the worst stress, then it's no stress. But you see my point. Yeah. How did you, how do you manifest this to come real and, and to provide you money? Because I've manifested the podcast. I've done it. I'm doing it. I'm not making any money from it yet. Right. Yeah. So how do you, yeah. how did you get to do that? To be honest with you, it was kind of a work in progress where it was, there was an overlap where because it was motivational speaking, it wasn't like, right, I've created this business. And I need to put everything into this business that I didn't have time to do a full-time job. I was able to put out some things where I was doing stuff for free whilst I was still an investigator. So doing some pro bono work of getting my story out there. Um, the text talk came out whilst I was still an investigator. So it was, again, that TEDx talk was good credibility and I knew that it was going to be a platform. Yeah. And then it just kind of, it went on from there where I was able just to, you know, work late nights, being able to put the effort in to be like, right, this is what I want to do full time. And it was probably a point where I'm like, well, is this going to be a hobby or is this going to be a, a job? And when I yeah. started seeing a little bit of traction of people interested, then I was like, no, this is actually, this could be a job and this is what I want. So it came to a point where I thought, right, right I've, I've started now to get some paid gigs on top of what I was doing. But now I have to take that leap and and go fully on it. So yeah, it was it was a work in progress. And I think many people with their businesses will be like that. It's there's an overlap because yeah. not many people can just quit and then just go. There's that overlap. So it, there was definitely the overlap for me for a good few months anyway, just to get my feet under the table and putting my story out there and putting the feelers out there see if this is this something that people would even want <laughs> and then yeah. it's transpired it is yeah it's amazing it's motivating for me because it keeps me going anyway just to exactly. hear that that overlap period um, hey. i'm going to bring i'm going to bring another picture because those who are from england probably will know this guy um 
I've not really asked you about this, but it's a picture that I have seen online, and you did uh, um, send this one to me also. But I was probably going to use this. But Mr. Yeah. Chris, Chris Evans, I don't know if you remember the show. You you're about ten years younger than me, but don't forget your toothbrush. I don't know if you ever remember that show he did no, I on don't. Channel I Four. Don't. That's why I grew up with Chris Evans. You might only remember Chris Evans being on the radio, and that's where you are yeah. with him. Um, but yeah, he did quite a few sh good shows. TGI okay. Fridays. Me, me oh yes, I remember that one. Do you remember yes. that one? And there's yeah. another one called to "Don't Forget Your Toothbrush" on uh, okay. Channel Four in the UK. <laughs> he was okay. brilliant back in those days. But anyway, talk to us about Chris Evans and w w why you were here. Yeah, so it was kind of a full circle moment because I remember Chris Evans back on what was it? Would it have been BBC Radio or maybe yeah. I can't remember what. Be. I think yeah. It'd be, yeah. And um, I remember my, my mum going to work every day and coming back and be like, oh, I was listening to Chris Evans' show today and he was telling us this, 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 and he had these nuggets of um, inspiration and motivation. And she loved him. And I was only a kid then. I was probably 14, 15, something like that. And then he obviously left there, did, did what he did in Top Gear and things like that and went back onto, oh, about that. onto the air. And he did BBC, I don't know, he's on Virgin Radio. Yeah. And he's got his own breakfast show. And I got the opportunity to share my story on his on his show about the seven steps to a happier life. And I remember sitting there thinking, wait a minute, this is surreal. This is a full circle moment. Because now, you know, even when I was an investigator, I would listen to the Virgin Radio show with him on it, getting the nuggets, like my mom once did, getting the nuggets of inspiration. And there I was on the show giving the nuggets of inspiration and i just thought Amazing. that you just can't you just can't make some of this stuff up this is a full circle moment completely and sitting opposite him being able to talk about the nuggets i had and some of the nuggets that he's got to jump on top of it too it was just brilliant it was it was a great it was a great time for me personally but also professionally because i felt like what i'm doing is it's working it's yeah. working because i'm here now and it was you get again bringing more credibility to me and i was very fortunate to be able to have been invited onto the show in the first place so yeah. it was it was brilliant and he was very kind with yeah. with his time too so it was just a great full circle moment and that's the best way to say it yeah you must have been sat there going not that you've made it but you're going i'm doing something right yeah i felt like i was on the right trajectory and i'm so yeah relentless and i'm so ambitious that i'm like i keep going keep going and i never one of the things i'll never settle and i'll never be like okay i've done this right that's me now done and re just rely on it be like okay i've done this that's that's it i'm always wanting more and wanting more and yeah. when i was on there but you know when i'm sitting opposite him i did have a big cheshire grin on my face to be like this is good because it's what i want to be doing and it's the trajectory of what I'm doing and you know the week before I was on Robin Sharma was on and these big offers these big inspirational speakers in um, in this field had been on a show and then I was thinking there's me on it like you know um, Mo Gaudet was on it two days before I was on I think yeah. and I was just like and there's me so it was just a full circle moment that really? I thought I'm, I was mixing with the right people that I want to be associated with you know yeah. if people are thinking Mo Gaudet and Robin Sharma I want them to be thinking Rob Hosking too and I'm by no means saying that I'm with them at the minute it's so such a work in progress but that's the goal but to be on a show that they're on it was it was good I know you feel the same about leading on leading our own way by the way um yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely yeah, of course I'm, I'm only joking that, that's me by the way um yeah. <laughs> just just quickly before we come to the end um Talk to us about where you hit, where are you in this picture? I wanted to so, ask. I was I was always curious. That was in July, a couple of months ago, where I was shortlisted for the best newcomer speaker at the Speaker Awards. Oh wow! I, unfortunately, I didn't get the didn't get the award, but being shortlisted yet again was one of those things where, like, I'm I am very hard on myself, so I was like, I'm disappointed that I didn't win. But no. I look back and I realize, Rob, you know, a few years ago. Or a, a year ago, you wouldn't even be able to speak about your experience. And, you know, best newcomer, it's not about who's going to be the best newcomer. It's about how you're going to finish. It's not about how you start. But being able to be shortlisted was such an honor. Oh. And it was just, 
I, I had to, to be honest with you, I did have to reframe it as a positive because I was disappointed it didn't win. And yeah. that's my natural, natural mindset. Competitiveness. I didn't win. Yes, that's it, 100%. But yeah. I was proud of, I say proud of myself, I don't, I don't like saying proud of myself, but I was, I pat myself in the back that I was able to rephrase it and say, no, Rob, no, you're on the, yet again, that trajectory, you're on the right trajectory, you're at an awards night with speakers and I'm looking around the room with different speakers all around the UK and all around the world people were from and I was looking at them thinking I know who they are they're the ones that I'm they've been in the industry for 20 years or whatever 30 years I want to be where they are and more so being able to be surrounding myself with these people it's all this idea of you are the average of the five people you spend your most time with so by surrounding myself with these people I was like this is it yeah my circle's different and Although I didn't win, there was there was definitely positives from it, yeah. and also I got to dress up in a tux, so that's always good. <laughs> Looking good, my man. <laughs> <Looking> good. <laughs> um, all right, before I finish off with my typical traditional questions, um, I like the bit. Remember the earlier in the episode when you talked about uh, the end of your life and the the um, mm. what word did you use? Ghost demons? What was it? I've forgotten the terminal. The, the ghost. Ad- well, it was ghost, wasn't it? Um, with the ghost that would meet you at the gate. What? What if, if not at all, um, if something was to happen to you today and you were going to go to those gates, would there be any ghosts there? I, 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 no, no, because when I look at the ghosts of regret of maybe joining the police in the first, in the first and foremost, I can never say it to regret because I reframe it to be like, it would be where I am today. Exactly. I have regrets as a kid where I didn't, you know, I was a very promising young footballer and I had opportunities and I maybe didn't take them as much as I could have. And I do firmly believe like I could have made it as a footballer, but yet again, I love football. I love playing football, but I love what I do now. And this is my goal and this is my passion and I can help people. So I don't, I don't like regret and I don't believe regrets there. We can all think we should have done more traveling when we were young. We should have done this. We should have done this. But, you know, life's life. I can do the traveling soon. I can yeah. do the traveling anytime in my life. So there won't be any ghosts because I've got that in my head, always thinking to myself, Rob, don't pass up this opportunity. Rob, don't let yourself down here. Rob, don't just dream this go for it, follow it. Um, I'm not saying I've always made the right decisions, not in the slightest. I've made bad decisions, but I can't regret them because I, every decision and every negative thing you've been through builds you who you are today. And for me, looking at myself today, I'm like, you know what? Yes, I'm happy with the person I am today. But there, that's built up with the good things and the bad things. And I'll have things that I do that maybe irk some people or whatever. But we all have personality traits that people may not like or whatever. Mm. But it's me. And if I can look in the mirror and be happy with the person staring back, can you have any regrets? Probably no. not. So that's why I always aim for in my life to be like, well, as long as I can stare myself, even though I've done mistakes and made mistakes, as long as I can be happy with the person staring back, then I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. So future future plans, Rob. Where you, what's in your mind? What you're manifesting right now? To be honest with you, I, I want to, people say this maybe can be quite arrogant, but I want to be the best. I want to be the best motivational speaker in the UK, never mind the world. I want to be the best, but the best comes with it, this act of service. I want to be the best because I want the, my story to have an impact on more people. I want to be the best because I believe that my lessons can help businesses, can help people. It's not because I want to be the best because I want all the riches and glam in the world. I want to be the best because it would mean that I'm having an impact. And my life's purpose is impacting people positively. So being the best would mean that I'm impacting more people. So I strive for that. Amazing. And has anyone ever actually reached out to you and, and, and said how you've helped them? Yes, even you know, even after my TEDx talk, 
there was a police officer there and he said he was going through similar things that I have been going through. Oh, wow. And he said, you've just changed my perspective on so many things. And I'm now going to take some things into action. And many of the talks that I do give, people come up to me after and say, you've just changed something there where you made me think this, you made me think that. So it's always lovely to get the feedback that mm. I am helping people. Look, I don't need the feedback because people don't necessarily, I don't need that thing of people telling me, oh, by the way, you help me. But it's yeah. beautiful to see because yeah. um, it's just lovely to see that you actually are helping people and people are so appreciative of it. And it's what I do and what I love about what I do. It's helping people and seeing the positive impacts it can have on their lives. Absolutely. So if um, if anybody was, anyone who's watching this who can resonate with your story, but they're in that messy middle part of their lives and are not sure which path to walk on and go down, what part, what piece of just simple advice would be the next best step to start on for tomorrow for them? Do you, do you, what can you give to them? I always say the most simple thing that we can all do in our lives is understand who we are. And people think, oh, easier said than done. But literally understand who you are. What do you like? What do you not like? What's your passions? What is definitely not your passion? Because when we can understand these things, when you can understand, oh, but I love going out for coffee. I love traveling. I love doing this. I love doing that. It forms your values by just understanding what you like and what you dislike, because then you can form it in like, like I love going out for coffee, but coffee isn't a core value. Yes. If only, mm. well, maybe to some people it might be, um, mm. but it's not a core value. But what does that represent to me? It's the freedom aspect. It's the flexibility. Anybody for me, I'm like, you can be going through the difficult times in your life, but understanding who you are, because people might think they know who they are. They might be like, oh, well, I like this. I like doing this. It's not about knowing what you like and dislike. It's about how the likes and dislikes form who you are and what your values are. So get clear, get clear on, on your values. That's the biggest, we've talked about values a few times already in, in this chat, but it's so important understanding who you are what makes you tick yeah if you don't do that and you can't understand that then there's everything else is really hard isn't it exactly you're fighting yeah. an uphill battle and there's many things you know i would never have joined the police if i had probably understood my core values at 22 and this mm -hmm. and you'll probably be a good person to speak to about it but it needs to come into education people need uh -huh. to be educated at a young age what values are never mind mindfulness things and, and things like that yeah Oh, I completely agree. I, I think we need to start off with just focus and attention at the moment because everyone's yeah. distracted big yeah, time. 100%. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole other episode, that one, Rob, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, it, it, it's pretty crystal clear uh, what your purpose is, but if you can put your purpose into one simple sentence, what would it be? Helping businesses and people create happier healthier lives what a great way to end the episode rob i um thank you for your time i appreciate you. you joining me all the way from valencia spain it's uh we we we've gone over the two hour mark it's uh, been a fascinating episode i've learned so much from you i'm so grateful for you joining me on my journey because this is my journey uh, and i'm i wanted to create many people have said to me um, sharing these journeys with people these i don't like to call them stories but these journeys that people have been on are so powerful and if one person can just take pieces of you today um um we've done our job right and uh I'm really grateful for you joining me on, on uh, Leading Our Own Way. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. I absolutely loved it. I appreciate it. And um, you're welcome back anytime. Um, and Thank if you, you come back to Melbourne, you've said coffee quite a few times today. So we're going to well, have a coffee. Yes. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Stay on the line, Rob. We'll speak um, to you shortly. But um, everybody else, come back next week for another amazing journey. Um, there's loads coming more from Leading Our Own Way. From Rob and I, have a great week. And... Um, Discover your purpose, everybody. We'll speak to you soon. Bye for now. Thanks for listening and watching Leading Our Own Way. So we can stay together forever and share more incredible journeys, please subscribe to the channel. That way you won't miss next week's episode and what that amazing guest has to offer to the world. Please support Leading Our Own Way and we'll get you on next week's episode.